Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by supporters of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a supporter, first of all, thank you so much. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other content like writing and other podcasts by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today, I am very honored to talk with Lindsay Tabus. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, how's it going? Pretty well. Thank you, you know, for coming and showing up. I mean, I really appreciate this. Of course. So Lindsay... Lindsay and I kind of bonded. She is a technologist, just as I used to be at the very least. Um, also the host of the Make Sense podcast, which you will find on YouTube. There's a link in the show notes. And Lindsay, you also developed um, Labs, which is a the pre-seed startup blueprint. Um, you and I met through Dreamers and Doers, and that's kind of a fun thing. Maybe I'll link that again. I always seem to start to to forget to link that one. But I want to start off just kind of with you, some background information. We, you and I both have sort of this, you know, this background in technology. Um, can you tell me just, you know, what got you interested in, in technology, you know, from an early age? Because you said this is like an ongoing, I don't know if you used the word obsession. I'm trying to remember how you said it before, but... You could tell me it. about <laughs> Tell me about the early years. I mean... I mean <laughs> I could go, you know, all the way back to the fact that, you know, my, my dad always had a computer in our house and, you know, we played uh, Oregon Trail and, and printed out banners on those printers with like the dotted lines on the side yes. of the papers yep. and um, sure. all of that stuff, you know, but I think the simple explanation is that my dad was a civil engineer and most women that go into engineering have a dad or brother who is also an engineer. So my dad was a civil engineer. Uh, he never let me cross a bridge without explaining how the thing was built. And <laughs> he That's never awesome. uh, changed a tire without making me help him, you know, uh, whether I loved these things or not when I was younger <laughs> is a different story. Um, and eventually I took AP physics in high school. I thought AP physics was the bee's knees. It was so interesting sure. that I decided, uh, when applying for college that I would apply to the engineering school. It okay. did help obviously that Applying as a, a as a young woman to the engineering school is like sure. my acceptance. Uh, like chances were much higher, uh, and I got to go to University of Virginia, which is a number one public school in the country. And coming from out sure. of state, that was going to be hard. Uh, oh my the gosh! Funny, yeah. yeah. So the the funny thing is, though, and just to connect it to where I am right now is that I went to I went to school thinking I'd study mechanical engineering and I learned about this discipline called systems and information engineering. It's sure. The intersection of computer science, um, statistics and and industrial engineering, so business process optimization stuff like that. And it was so exclusive and everyone wanted to be in it so badly that you had to apply. You didn't have to apply sure. to get into the other majors. So obviously I wanted the best and needed to prove that I was the best. And so I applied. And um, the first semester, my sophomore year, the first semester starting my major, um, I took a class in human factors and ergonomics, uh, read mm -hmm. Don Norman's Design of Everyday Things, which is a seminal book in the human computer interaction field. And sure. that's where I would say the obsession of designing technology for people, designing technology to really make people's lives easier and, and freer. That in my head was like, that's the obsession, right? Is, is how can we, you know, free ourselves up uh, and, and design, solve real problems. So then yes. going to grad school and entering my career was all kind of human computer interaction, user experience, user interface, user research, all yeah. of that. You, you know, you, 
you started off the story, or not started off, but you said, you know, it helps that, that you were a woman in engineering. I'm not letting you off the hook. I know you are like stupidly intelligent. That is a poor way of putting that, but I know enough about you. You are ridiculously intelligent and it's not like you floated through on, you know, no. gender alone. Period. No, I did not. No, I, I did not. You know, and that, to be honest, it was mostly in reference to the fact that uh, if you would like to go to University of Virginia and you are applying from out of state sure. to the School of Arts and Sciences, you have a 6% chance of getting in. Oh, shoot. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Out of state. So applying early decision to the engineering school and as a woman you know, right. okay. all of these things was like, yes, I am going to get to go to the school that I really want to go to. Yeah. But I did decide to stay in engineering and I proved my worth. <laughs> I had those late nights. I took linear algebra and probabilistic forecasting and, <laughs> you know, Do all you these really crazy classes and suffered I, through. I loved linear algebra, actually, though. I and did. I had <laughs> Yeah. For some reason, matrices make a ton of sense to me. Everybody else in the class was like, what in the flying hell is a character? And I'm like, well, you just forget it. I love math. I, 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 I love math. And um, going to grad school, it was quite funny that my total GRE score and my total SAT score were the same, like 1350. Oh, but weird. My, but my math score went up 150 points, which means my verbal had to go down. But Good I nearly point. got a perfect 800 on my GREs because I oh, am geez. a nerd. I love math. And I will brag about that until I die. <laughs> no, I think that's awesome. Do you, you know, I actually way, way have the hell off tangent. But, you know, I started off in biology and then later went into chemistry. And as a, bi as a biology major, it was like, I don't really give a crap about calculus, right? Like, with so I'm going to be like messing with Petri dishes. Nobody cares about, you know, D DX, DY when you're messing with yeah. Petri dishes. So, but then I got to um, a quantum physics course, a modern physics course, I guess. And I was like, oh, shoot, if I don't learn my calculus, I'm never going to pass this. And then I went back and looked at it and went, hey, this is actually more fun than I thought. Yeah. So that was when I learned calculus was <laughs> was to figure out the Schrodinger equation. So <laughs> unexpected, but, uh, you know, that's where you go. I'm not following you down this trip, this, this tangent. Let's get back to this. Good. Okay. That's fine. We won't. So now that being said, you did, so your, your podcast right now, the, 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 um, you know, if you look at the title, it says lady engineer, I mean, at least your YouTube, you know, the YouTube branding that you've got is lady engineer. And we did mention stuff about, um, you know, we, a woman in engineering, but what, why use that branding? Like where, what, uh, tell, tell me about the branding first of all, I'm going to go to something else afterward, but tell me about that branding in particular. I trademarked the lady engineer in 2017 when I was already four years into being self-employed, but was mm -hmm. launching labs. I did a total rebrand. And I launched this program, Labs, which we can talk about later. But Lady Engineer was actually to thumb my nose at the fact that being me in tech was still an anomaly. I see. In 2017, certainly. Oh, so it's not about pink heels and pink computers and, you no. know, chic this and whatever, making it girly is actually saying like WTF. Sure. Why is this an anomaly, really? I, and to be honest, in my kind of view, it actually feels worse than it was when I started. It, my major, systems and information engineering, over 30% of my classmates were women, two of which were in my sorority. So like, you know, we were, <laughs> right? Um, and 
I remember getting a $1,000 kind of fellowship grant from the National Science Foundation for being a woman in engineering. And I was like, I am, and we weren't using these terms in 2003, four, but I am a privileged white girl from the suburbs of Philadelphia. Why am I getting a thousand dollars <laughs> towards my tuition, but I was like, Hey, I'll take it. Um, sure. you know, when I started my career in San Francisco, yeah, uh, I was really the only woman on the technology and product team. And it just kind of kept going like that. And, um, I was proud of it. I had lots to learn, sure. Oh, I, sure. you know, I was a guy's guy, good kind of girl, you know, whatever. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I looked around in 2017 and I was like, Hey, like I've been out of college for 12 years and we're still fighting the same battles. Like we're having the same conversation and some people in my community, um, whether they were women or, you know, not, don't identify with a a gender or whatever, were like, I think it's actually getting worse. You know, I I think that the programmer has made things worse. Yeah. No, I agree. Because, I mean, I started as as a software developer in 1998, and it didn't seem like it didn't seem rare. And I was even in aerospace, Mm -hmm. and it didn't seem rare, which, you know, aerospace is another, you know, level of of uh, of of gender um, inequity on top of that. But it didn't even seem that rare in aerospace as a software developer to see women. But mm-hmm. by the time I was getting ready to, to retire in, you know, you know, from software anyway, um, in 2022, you know, many of the conversations I had with, with upper management was like, Oh, well, why don't we hire this person? Because she's a girl and it'll make us look like, you know, we're very, you know, we have a, a ton of DEI. And I'm like, how about if we just like hire people based on, you know, cause, cause she's smart. Not because we're going to say because she's a girl, you know, like that. Personally, I found that kind of offensive. That was a real conversation I had. Yeah, that's it does. I know. So I I, think it's gotten worse. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for it, you know, no. and, and if I did, we'd be in a different situation. Right. Um, but I do think that the way technology has evolved over my career the mm-hmm. past few decades, and I know you've watched it too, that drives the inspiration for my podcast, Make Sense, where we simplify yes. complex issues at the intersection of tech and people. Because I think that for some reason, the technology industry has enjoyed, in a way, how complex what they do is and no one can weigh in on it. And how could you possibly (laughs) know? And the reality is, is like, I want to explain to people what is going on in this industry. Who are these decision makers that are like, oh, we need another girl on the team or something like Mm -hmm. that. Those are the people that are working on your social media algorithms that are affecting your mental health. So let's have a conversation, not just about the technologies that we're putting out into the world, but also the people behind them and their purview, their approach to solving problems, which really affect how we live our lives. Right. Yeah, it was the follow up I was going to ask about Lady Engineer was to to see if it was, you know, if it, if it, what the intent was to say that, cause you know, sort of the, the, um, stereotype is that, you know, women, women are more feeling more capable of, of, of human understanding. And I wondered if the juxtaposition of lady and engineer was to say, you understand better that intersection between humans and computers and, and technology, I should say. So, yeah. yeah so thanks. 100%. That, I yeah. it, it it the lady engineer offers a different approach to 
conceptualizing solutions and bringing yeah. them to market in a way that I think is more responsible as well right. as more uh, efficient and lean than the, I'll say, like kind of male dominated approach to startup development, which is, oh, I thought of an idea and I must be as amazing as Steve Jobs. So I'm just going to build it and everyone will come. And I don't care how much money I waste and how many people I hurt to get this right. thing out into the market. And that's why we have a 90% startup failure rate. Right. Oh, sure. So, so I spent, you know, 20 years sitting back and like watching, you know, everything, um, whether it was working full time for startups or working, you know, as an independent contractor and then developing labs and working with over 75 plus founders to do it differently, you know, and I honed in on what are the mistakes that we keep making over and over and over again? Right. right. And can we fix them? Right. You, I, cause I, I mean, I believe wholeheartedly in the, the, the contribution that you, you use, you used a phrase, you said that, you know, it's easy for technologists to say, well, look, you'll never understand this. Right. Cause I mean, you know, we have this, this, there's the stereotype first of all, of like, you know, the, the 300 pound dude and his mother's Basement with like a neck beard debugging the Linux kernel at, you know, 4 a.m. on a Friday night or more, whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah two, I get it. Yes. Mountain Dew and Cheetos and stuff. But it's like, you know, obscuring concepts like helps nobody. And, and you know, like in my opinion, I think technology has been held back because of that. Go, go ahead. It, it actually, so this is, this is, and, and I know you're going to ask me a little bit about where labs came from. And yes. I've talked a little bit about the, the passion there, but one of the things that uh, kind of connects these topics of over, making technology overly complex and hard to understand and then like just doing things differently is that I was tired of talking to entrepreneurs who were getting like the hood pulled over them by software developers. Yes. Oh, sure. Because, and I'd say that software developers, there's some of them, there's some, I've worked with amazing people, but there are some who, if they don't agree with your idea they'll just tell you it's not possible because yes. they don't want to build it. Yes. Right. <laughs> you know, like you look a little guilty, like you may no, have done I was, it. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I, so I will say this, there, there are times when you go, listen, we need to do, you know, we need to, we need to revamp the whole security, you know, the way security is being done here. And a client will go or a customer will be like, oh yeah, no, that sounds, you know, really difficult, but can we make the buttons red? on on the web page and you go god we'd love to make the buttons red you know what's holding us back is that the whole security the framework of security <laughs> the two have nothing to do with each other no as so there is a hex code as if a different hex code in the css is what's gonna blow up i know but don't look don't call me out now because i'm gonna have people calling me up and going did you were you lying when you said you had to, what no Shit, did you watch that thing with Lindsay? Damn you. <laughs> but but it's you know, so I'm not entirely guilty of that. Um that being said, I mean, we you know, you get people you had said, Oh, I'm as smart as Steve Jobs, so I should be able to do whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, the the concept that really what it takes to to make a successful company is just being Hubris. a dick. Yeah, hubris. <laughs> Perfect. Hubris being a dick is not the case. Those are no. anomalies. Those are anomalies. I agree. Right? I agree. And we agree. idolize these anomalies. So mm -hmm. then we just keep getting a bunch of freaking garbage technology yes. because we think that we're going to be like these anomalies. But you know what? The anomalies, Steve Jobs, Henry Ford. Their stories aren't even understood correctly. Henry Ford burned through like three rounds of financing Ooh. and had to beg investors 
for more really? money before he came up with the horse. Okay. Not the, the car. I'm getting car, things sure. confused. My brain's moving fast. The horse, <laughs> this whole quote that like, oh, if I listened to my customers, I would just have made a faster horse yeah. is BS. Right. Because what he did was he did listen to his customers. He failed a lot too. He listened to his customers and he understood between the lines that they wanted to move faster, not that they needed a horse to go faster. So I hate it when entrepreneurs in the industry come and say, I don't need to listen to my customers or I talk to all my friends and family and they love what I, what I, my idea right right because your mom's gonna know right yeah Yeah, and like (laughs) steve jobs predicted the ipod and iphone revolution and it was like that didn't happen either that guy walked into xerox park in the peninsula in silicon valley he saw the technology that was being developed there yes he (laughs) relied on both private research and publicly government funded research to develop his products. On top of that, the iPod that evolved into the iPod Touch and the iPhone, like there were other MP3s out there. He didn't like invent the idea of an MP3. He put a screen on it and then he decided the screen could be touched. And that's how it's, and he took away my Blackberry and my haptic feedback and I will forever bemoan that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Now that but. being said, now I will tell you, I'm not a, not I a huge digress. Apple. <laughs> I'm not a huge Apple fan. I've no, owned, you know. Actually, I was given. I used to work at OtterBox mm-hmm. long long ago when OtterBox was was new. I should probably the, not the say phone that, case but. company, right? Yes, the case company. Yes, <clears throat> and when that first iPod uh, iPad came out, you know, they they made a case for it, and so what they did was say, you know, we're going to give everybody an iPad. And we're actually going to give you one of the the cases that are selling like shit. It was part of it was partly so that they could get rid of the cases for what it's worth. They handed out like two hundred iPads. You know, it was sort of interesting. But anyway, the point here is to to say that you know I've owned one Apple product in my life, which was an iPad, <clears throat> and and I wasn't really fond of it. So. To get back to what you were saying, though, because you said, you know, Steve Jobs didn't do these things. And I will say, you know, just in somewhat Apple's defense, they inspire people. And and it's the company, not necessarily the products. Um, you know, the idea of thinking different was is is a huge thing. And that's a great testament to their branding team. I mean, and their their products are great. I'm an Apple fan. What I am not a fan of is the entrepreneurial hubris. Yeah. And to be honest, laziness uh, and ego-driven kind of creation of technology. Yeah. In the name of believing the myth of Henry Ford and Steve Jobs, because those are myths. They did listen to their customers. They did do a ton of research. Sure. And what happens for most startup founders is that they experience a problem. They come up with a solution that works for them, and they think that makes a business. And it's not. Right. And the problems continue to unfold from there. And it's that observation that I've had that drove... One, the creation of labs, uh, which is a six-month learning experience to help founders get go from idea to something in the market in the most lean and efficient way without wasting a ton of money with software developers, right? And also the inspiration for Lady Engineer, which, again, to thumb my nose at the establishment, the established thought process for how we innovate is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And it takes a lady engineer to offer a different approach. And the different approach is what labs is and became. Which is a perfect segue into it. I mean, because what's obviously you don't want to give away a ton because, you know, 
there, there's a business behind this, but you know, what, what, what is so wrong? How about if I just ask that question? Cause I have a thought, but tell me, what is so wrong that, that somebody would need, so what is so wrong with, with entrepreneurs that the um, labs can help address? Yeah. So, um, man, there's a lot. Uh, one, I already explained the kind of the, this idea that we just come up with an idea and we put it out there. Um, and that's one of the myths I cover in my product market fit talk. If you build it, they will come. We all yeah. know that's not true. Right. But the first myth we fall into is that, you know, if I experience a problem and figure out a way to solve it for myself, that makes a business, right? Sure. And that's just not the case. Like a problem is only worth solving if there's a market that really needs it solved, right? <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, People only talk to a few strangers, family or friends, log those as customer discovery calls, but then just like only listen to what they want to listen to. And they sure. bulldoze through product development. They start, they're like a non-technical founder is like, hey, I need to hire a software developer right away, right? Well, building software is expensive. They oh, underestimate sure. the complexity of building software the average software project goes 3x over scope. You thought you were going to spend 5000 It's 15000 So I'm like getting tired of watching people lose a lot of money because they don't sure. understand who they need to hire and what steps that they can do to build something, right? Because the industry loves to put the software engineer on a totem pole as like a god, they love the idea that an entrepreneur has an idea and the first suggestion is to go talk to a software developer, right? But if you are going to build a big house or a multi-use commercial residential complex, would you go talk to the construction worker or the architect or yes, the economic development group or the chamber right. of commerce? You talk to all those other people before a construction worker, right? Yeah. So that's one part is like, we need to understand how technology gets built so that the innovators amongst us don't get hosed when they <laughs> want to bring an idea to market, right? Sure. So that's like one thing that makes me angry and like why I want to clarify how technology is developed um, and bring down, like may, just simplify how, how to go about it. Um, the other thing is, is that we are very egocentric creatives, right? We think of things that solve our problems and we think sure. that's going to solve everyone else's problem. But I ask you and your audience, you ever have an idea for a really fun weekend getaway with your friends or your family and you're like, we should do this, like have a kissing booth in the central square and raise money for X, like whatever your wildest idea is, right? And then everyone replies and is like, you're on your own, right? No, I want you to know that kissing booth worked really, I made like 30 bucks that day. No shit. All right. 30 bucks. But you get it, right? So like yes. now you have a great idea and you just put $30,000 behind it, building it. <laughs> right. Only and everybody else goes. That no one likes it. it. Yes. The other kind right. of metaphor, like a analogy I use is like, I, I I don't know. I know you're in Colorado. Have you ever shot a gun? Have you ever shot a gun? In in my life, yes. Okay. Oh, in 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 Colorado, actually, for that matter. Sure. But. So when <laughs> when think. if you're sh like doing target practice and you're using a gun that's not yours, the idea sure. is that you would calibrate the eyesight before sure. you start shooting. Shoot sure. Right. And, and I'm left-handed too, and no sights are set up for lefties. Yeah. And, so. and but listen, if you don't like guns, whoever's listening, like we can talk about archery too. Like you have to figure out a calibration. You have to calibrate your eye, eyesight before you shoot, right? Mm -hmm. Ready, aim, fire, okay? For some reason in tech and in venture capital and startups, 
we're just like ready, fire, ready, fire, ready, fire. Like this whole fail fast mentality where we like just break stuff and put stuff out there. I'm like, that might work for a software developer who is an entrepreneur because they can afford to just build stuff and break it. But a non-technical founder that has to pay software developers to build something cannot afford to just go ready, fire, ready, fire, right? They need to aim. Agreed. They need to aim. And I also, <clears throat> for what it's worth, um, process like software development process is a little bit of a hobby for me. Yes. Because I, I kind of remember like cheering in 2001 when the Agile Manifesto was signed, which... Was God, that 2001? It was 2001. Yes. And isn't it great that uh, what's his name put up Lean Startup, like he invented Agile and it was only a decade later. That's another thing about this industry. We just keep recycling ideas and putting new terms on it. Yeah. Well, (laughs) yes. But see, in my opinion, so Agile software development is now thought of as ready fire which was never the case. It was never an iterative approach to something is to learn from your mistakes and not just to go, okay, what do we do? You know, that didn't work. Throw something else out. Well, that didn't work. Throw something out. Well, that didn't work either. Throw something. No, you learn from it. Yeah. And, 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 you know, sooner or later where you were going with, with target practice sooner or later, like, you know, spiral in on what you actually wanted. Your precision (laughs) and accuracy get better, right? Yes. And if they don't, mm -hmm. that's an indication your process is wrong. Yeah. Period. To to tie it all together again with um, the passion I have for designing technology for people and solving real problems, being in the industry, I'd worked with so many technologists who pursued a product because it was fun to build and they wanted to learn oh sure the technology and then they try to back into a problem that they're solving right right and right. that was producing again more technology that really wasn't solving problems yeah it was like a shoehorn yeah. like you know ramming circle peg square you know and right. <laughs> um it, what I saw in 2017 when I trademarked the lady engineer and I started the first version of labs was that a lot of non-technical founders were entering the space and non-technical founders are less likely to build something because the technology is cool and more likely to build something to solve a problem. Right. True. More likely. Like they're not like, oh, I just want to play with AI or I just want to play with blockchain and let's see if we can build a dating app on blockchain. Like whatever the <laughs> yes is, right? Um, sure. Uh, a million food and travel apps, and <laughs> right? Like, but uh, non-technical founders were more likely to be solving a problem. And that's where I wanted to help. Mm -hmm. I wanted to help them because I also saw that the skills that made me really good at what I did was not coding, was not syntax. It was object-oriented logic. Mm -hmm. It was relational database design. It was activity diagrams from like universal modeling language. Sure. These things are like, in my mind, really awesome arts and crafts and like drawing and fun. And a non-technical founder does not need to learn Python or Ruby on Rails to become good at under like designing the mechanics. And I'm able to design as an engineer, design solutions that uh, solve the problem in the time, with the time, skills, and resources that we have. Mm -hmm. I'm able to do that because I can get in the boat 
and cross the chasm to talk to software developers because of object-oriented programming logic, not syntax, <laughs> logic, right? Understanding database design and like how objects relate to each other. Sure. So these are skills that frankly should be taught in like every university, <laughs> right? Like it should be taught taught in like so many classes. Um, and, yes. be, and you don't have to be good at math or write code. No. I want to ask a question because I have, <clears throat> I have an answer to this question, but I want to ask of you because this problem, this, this chasm between software developer and entrepreneur is that the hubris we talked about before, is it putting, putting developers, you know, on, on a, on a pedestal? Like, what do you think is the major problem there? I, I got an opinion, but you tell me. Both sides are filled with hubris. Um, <laughs> it's the human ego. Um, <laughs> um, listen, um, I spent time building partnership agreements with software development firms because I understood that entrepreneurs were just always going to go straight to software developers. Sure, and I sure. Talked to software development firms, and a lot of them understood that if they took on a project from an entrepreneur that was not ready, that it was going to get very messy, Sure. that they were going to be managing scope creep all the time. And ultimately when the project failed, because 90% of startups fail, the entrepreneur is going to blame the software development shop. They're Absolutely. not going to blame the fact that they did not interview enough customers and validate their idea. They didn't Absolutely. calibrate, like I said. So software developers were willing to try to work with me. But here's the mm -hmm. thing. One, these dev shops have become a dime a dozen with every boot camp software developer starting their own agency. So the quality sure. is really low. But two, right. most of these dev shops are terrible at business development and sales. So they are groveling for their next project. It's very hard for them to turn away an entrepreneur they think is not ready because they need the money. And the entrepreneur sure. expects the software developer firms to be able to cross that entire chasm between what customers say to what the product should be. They should be able to do all of it. And it's just not the case. I agree. And that, that would be what I would identify as the major problem, that you have consulting companies who think the product is code, not a solved problem. You, you you spoke about, by the way, I got to tell you, in no way, shape, or form did I ever think that I would discuss UML on this <laughs> podcast. Baby bathwater. Oh. They threw it all out. They threw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Deep you were saying well. that agile meant learn, right? And, yes. and get ready. Right. And right. like somehow it's been twisted to fire aim, fire aim. And yes. I, the thing is that I also got very angry with over the past 20 years is that there were good modeling techniques that were part oh, of the waterfall sure. methodology. Like yes. UML activity diagrams help me and developers collaborate so well and yes. get on the same page. And they, it's like they, I mean, the industry just... Threw it out with the the threw the baby out with the bathwater sure. when they moved sure. to agile and lean because okay. everything was just in time. Every it's it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail, which has never been part of the agile and have money. But if you are not a software developer, building using the startup the popular startup blueprint, you will lose a ton of money and most likely oh, fail. Absolutely. But I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you remember, though, you, you know, the the cost of the cost of changes. I don't think it's exponential, but I know it went up. Like if you started in the design phase and you go, oh, crap, nobody likes red buttons. 
I don't mean the 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 comedian, it's but you know, to put, ad- it's it's cheaper to change to, a design. Yes, to change a design than if you go, you know, we got to the architecture and realized whoever did this never intended for there to be security. Like you go, oh, that's a major issue, you know. But if you're in design and you say, hey, should we have security on this? But like having somebody go, oh, damn, yeah, we ought to do that. That's easy. You know, requirements and design, you know, these are the those are the places to fail fast. I think that idea of fail fast, they're like, well, that's at the product level. And it should never be at the product level. Because well, if you and- fail that badly at the product level, you failed long before you got to software You're, code. Right. Exactly. And this is the thing that I hear a lot from entrepreneurs when I tell them, you know, you're underestimating the complexity of software development and the cost. They think they need to have a product built to get good feedback. But the reality is, is that your like what I talk about, the early evangelists, the people that are going to adopt your janky mm-hmm. tool when it's in its infancy. Sure. They can give feedback on designs and you can oh my catch gosh, stuff. Yeah. You can, and, and people don't understand that a kindergarten level of drawing can actually give you feedback that will save you tens of thousands of dollars oh, later. And, sure. and people, again, people don't understand. And why do they not understand? Is because the way our industry is constructed and obfuscated what technology and software developers do and make it sound more complex than it is blah, 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 like it, they made it more so complicated that people sure. can't, outsiders cannot capture or understand that drawings will give you great feedback. <laughs> sure, sure, you know? sure. So the- and I do want to bring it back to like one gender thing um, yes. before we move on. Um you know, you had said, you know, women are more known for being more touchy-feely or, St- you know. Stereotypically, em- yes. <laughs> empaths, right? So yes. a lot of the things that I think, um, and I'm going to say, like, this is a very binary thought. So I understand for people on the continuum of gender, it, it, there, there's some nuance that I am totally washing over. But... Women and female entrepreneurs are like often, you know, told that like they don't take as big risks as men and and they're much more like risk averse and cautious. And I wrote something in 2018 for Women History Month in a technically a, a online publication about how these things actually, I think, make women really great designers of yeah. technology because um, this whole like go big or go home have an idea, build it and put it out there. That was like male driven technologists and yes. 90% of startups fail. So being right. so risk uh, open to risk actually just has created a bunch of junk for us, right? Whereas sure. like women wanting to have a process or being more calculated and asking more questions before you know, putting something out there, I do think that that is something that we should value more, Be especially right now, just again, and right. this loops into make sense, but where we are with technology uh, on the precipice with, with AI and people freaking out about their jobs, which is a never ending story, blah, 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 blah. Like sure. we need to be really rethinking what we're putting out there. Because the current engine is putting out a lot of garbage. For sure. You know, there was a, gosh, there's a lot I want to bring up. There was, there's a, a Peter Drucker, I was reading a Peter Drucker book sometime. And, you know, Drucker's not new by any sense of, you know, Peter Drucker's, Peter Drucker originally started writing in the 50s, I think, you know, certainly reached, you know, his pinnacle by the seventies, but he, I read something when I was at this startup company 
And he said, you know, ask yourself first, who is your customer? This is a standard marketing, you know, technique, right? right? And I went to, this will circle around to a, a, a question, I promise. But I, I remember I went to the, you know, the C-suite that with the startup where I worked and I said, hey, who's our customer? And the CEO was like, <laughs> everyone product product guy who's our customer and product guy was like what the what the <laughs> and i was like we don't know do we and like the c suite was like what you're an idiot you have no idea what you you know do you Why know how much money <laughs> do you know how much money i got in seed funding and i'm like I don't really care who's our customer because I mean, you know, and, and at the time, by the way, I was presenting as a man and, and, you know, but I ask these types of questions where it's just like, listen, what, what do we intend to do? You know, I don't, I didn't want to take risks with like the engineering department I was managing if I didn't have to, you know, and if we're going to call that a feminine trait, well, at this point I've leaned into my feminine traits as it were. And so the question I was hoping to circle back to is, because I mean, as far as labs goes, it's you're training these types of things to say, listen, be more risk averse. I mean, presumably as part of it, I didn't I'm go not through saying it. That. But I'm saying being you, more calculated with your, more, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, that's a better way of saying that, you know, because it, it plays more into my question. The people I've worked with um, in C-suites and in, in technology startups like are these the type of people who are even gonna listen to that message are they the type of people who would would go to that training and get anything out of it it's complicated and this is, is a whole nother podcast episode it is <laughs> and no i know um <laughs> It's something I've mentioned several times and that I've learned over the years is like uh, running labs is a lot of these mistakes and myths we make have everything to do with our ego, deep-seated yes. fears, mm -hmm. fears of success, fear of failure, um, and... Um, I cannot change human nature. What I can do is empower people that want to do things differently. Okay. I can tell you that my product market fit talk, thousands of people have sat in on it. It is eye opening. People are like, sure. holy crap. Wow. But it is also, um, and the product market fit talk, I go through these myths and connect why we fall into these myths because of our anxiety or because of how we are, right. Right. our hubris or whatever. Um, but because the way we innovate is so deeply connected to human nature, um, how would I solve the problem? Not how would someone else solve the problem that, um, it's like they need to listen to it every year, like listen to the talk every year as a reminder, you know, yeah, possibly every morning. <laughs> right? So um, listen, the venture capital world still rewards that type of it does. person, right? It does. They, they yeah. still mostly, and, and I've done work on that side too. Uh, it's not in necessarily as big in my bio, but I evaluate, startups for investors for the past seven years. Mm -hmm. um, I've performed due diligence and, and, you know, really analyzed um, these businesses and systems and put my foot in the door uh, to, and open it for people behind me, you know, like uh, other female or queer found yeah. founders or people operating yeah. in this world. I've like, gotten them to do due diligence and stuff like that you know so um i'm 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 really committed to making these changes um but it's it's a long it's a it's a long battle because 
this system, like many systems that we all analyze, is mm -hmm. designed to favor um, a certain type of behavior. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is for me. I, I've never been able to just walk away and ignore it. You know, I think a lot of women leave STEAM and STEM, STEM fields because they just don't want to deal with it anymore, you know? And for me, every time I have left or taken a break, like I backpacked around the world for six and a half months in 2020, I just came right back to like, but I still want to do this. I still like this. It's because it, it, it's in my, it's in my heart. It's in my chest. It's not. I get that. It's yeah. not just an intellectual thing. Sure. Um, I really care about people, and I'm really very upset that of all the unfulfilled promises that technology has failed to meet. You know. I agree. Because I retired from. The technology fields, <clears throat> because I was a transgender woman among tech bros, mm -hmm. and it's soul sucking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and I wouldn't go back. I talked to a uh, to a friend of mine recently, another transgender woman, who, you know, architect level person had done a ton in her own startups, and she does not want to go back because. It's a tech bro industry. I mean, it's the the toxic masculinity is rewarded. Yeah. You know what I have on my side? Two things. And I want to write them down. One <laughs> is that I had parents that were playing Howard Stern on the radio when I was like elementary school. So some of the toxic stuff, like at least the sure. locker room talk, I'm just like, Bleh. whatever. You guys are gross boys. I get it. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, is that communication is one of my skills and individualization is another. These are according to like Gallup, right? In, uh, Gallup. Sure. Strengths. Yeah. And the way that I put it together is like, Winston Churchill said tact is the ability to tell someone to go fuck themselves. Sorry for <laughs> you saying. Right. And then thank you for it. Yes. Right? Yes. So, like, when I'm at my <laughs> finest, and I remember being in Denver and doing a startup founder meetup, and some guy's, like, trying to take the microphone away from me because he thinks, like, my my line of thinking is wrong. He wants to correct me. Sure. And, and, and I, like, let him talk for a bit, and then I corrected him, and I took the microphone back and moved back. And I got all these messages and people afterwards being like, oh, my God, you handled that so amazing, right? Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. And, like... Uh, so I think like these two things like have made me like, okay, okay in those spaces or at least have equipped me to survive in these spaces. Yeah. Um, but I will say everything that I did with labs and focusing on, focusing on non-technical founders and saying like the Silicon Valley way, the venture backed startup way of building startups is not the right way. Um, it was a departure from those spaces. It was saying like, I'm going to keep my foot in the door with these spaces, but I'm going to go in a different direction to help the people. Um, yeah. So, but that being said, I, I think in 2024, I'm veering back into those spaces uh, because my message needs to be heard. It does. Um, I mean, I thank you and I honor you for, for doing that because I couldn't, I mean, yeah. it's, it is, it wears you down. It wore me down, you know, to, yeah. yeah, over and over. I went, <laughs> no, you know. it's like, yeah, it, some of it is, is, is a lot of it <clears throat> freaking sucks. Right. Um, Absolutely. But there are. 
I'm coming at it from a very different place. Like, I'm not going to work full time. I'm expanding my guest list of makes sense to sure. bring in more of these bros, right? Like, I, sure. you know, trying to get get in a different way, you know? And there are people, there are good people there. There are definitely. I mean, I could name a few with whom <laughs> I'm still in touch, but... But it's drowned out. Yeah. I think is yeah. all I'd say. It gets drowned out. And that's, I don't know. I guess that's why I'm going to say thank you and honor you for, you know, your yeah. work in that. Because just too much. I I just pain. really believe that we need to design technology that supports us. So that we can all, you know, have a human experience in the future. Yeah. And yeah. if if I stop talking about it, then it's just, it's just inevitable, right? We have more people working on social media algorithms than we do on climate change, right? Well, that's a good point. Yeah. We have technology in enterprise enterprise software technology that is so onerous and burdensome sure. that it's adding to the amount of hours people work their jobs, right? And if people are working really, really hard and they're stressed and they're scared about the economic bottom coming out from under them, then they are not creative and they are not solving our world's biggest problems. So again, when we came up with a personal computer, we came up with all the different phases of technology in the 1900s and in the past two decades, it was all like, we're not going to have to work. Let's celebrate our ingenue, right? But we're working for <laughs> right. harder and harder. And it's because yeah. technology is not being designed in a way to support humans. It's being designed to minimize us and get us out of the way, right? I think you're right. So... I don't know. There's my TED talk. I'm going to re-listen to this podcast and have like my, uh, a new missive and treatise to, mm -hmm. to work off of going into 2024. Uh, I know we like went in a lot of different directions, kind of connecting you know, these dots. But, but it all ended up, I mean, it all ended up where I wanted to go, believe it or not. You know, and the funny thing was just, you know, quick aside, the funny thing was, is that you would say something and I'm like, oh, good. That actually moves right into where I wanted to go anyway. So it was, I mean, it was almost like, you know, like we'd scripted this and you knew where it, anyway. Um, I mean, there was one thing I just wanted to, cause, cause yes, this is absolutely a Ted talk. What, what I ended up doing was, was saying, I'm going to remove myself from what hurts and, and try to go from a different direction. Cause I mean, what I talk about now is identity and, and, and say, you know, and gender to say what we need to do is understand ourselves. And I think, I believe if we went down that road, we will see the, 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 the danger in the, the, let me just leave it at danger. The danger of this, methodology of working as you know from hubris working from you know machismo uh, you know that if we don't understand ourselves yeah we have no choice but to 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 hurt ourselves and um i mean i think we're coming at the same problem from two different directions which was why i wanted to talk to you in the first place we're we're so. definitely both the root of the the root of a lot of the problems is understanding ourselves yeah being able to like look at our thinking and saying is this fear based action is this right. ego based action right um yeah i mean that that's at the the root of it right yes and as entrepreneurs like being an entrepreneur actually is the quickest way to figure these things out. If you really want to, if you, if you, you know, because that, that you hubris, that guy, he has burnout on his horizon. He has a divorce on his horizon. Like there's, sure. there's things that are going to like destroy 
you know, and bring that person down, whether they grow from it or not, right? The the hubris of taking $5 million from investors building this thing and then it failing is that you just lost $5 million from people and, you yeah. know, you got to figure out how to move on. And to do that, you have to, mm-hmm. you know, check in with yourself. Dig yeah. deep. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. We do, we come at it from different ways. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you brought up $5 million. I was thinking about this the other day in three startups that I've been a part of off the top of my head, I can compute about a hundred million dollars, maybe a little more, a hundred million dollars, probably more of money that was, that ultimately went nowhere. A hundred million I mean, that's more money than, you know, several small countries making in a year, you know, bigger, this is bigger than the GNP of several countries, a hundred million dollars that was thrown away. Anyway, I think that could go, go on and on and on. It's Um, not just startups that fail at a 90%. It isn't. It's actually like USAID projects fail. At a 90% rate, Bill and Mm -hmm. Melinda Gates Foundation accepts 90% failure. Um, So that's why you go like, that's where you go like, are we really that bad at solving problems? And it's actually, yes, we are really that bad at solving problems. We're bad at, I think we're bad at analyzing what problem to solve. Yep. And and maybe they're the same thing. Maybe it's the same thing. You know, because we're not, we're great at solving problems. We are, you know, humanity has solved mo- I mean, ridiculous problems. Yeah. Put people on a, the moon, you know, we're unless also you believe great in the at conspiracy. Creating them too. Well, there's that. And we get um, in our own ways. So yeah. I want to share with your audience in the show notes like uh, a link to my product market fit talk. So if anyone wants to listen yes. to it, because I, I do start off with the acknowledgement that there's a ton of failure everywhere, not just in the startup world. Um, so if, if people would like that, and then I, I maybe will link to a different episode of my podcast where I go through um, with my guests, like the design of technology and how we design, we try to design people out of mm-hmm. the solution. Um, mm-hmm. And then we just externalize more problems and how this kind of just feeds an engine so that enterprise software at work sucks for everyone. So if that, <laughs> I'll, I'll do those two, two okay. links for you to share with your audience. Cool. Um, no, thank you. I think it's yeah. important for everyone. You want people to think through identity um, and get to know themselves I want people to be able to see the world similar to I like do with the systems and the tech and the solutions yeah. and the mismatch um, mm-hmm. and to see that all around us and understand how it's affecting us too. And I will, I will only say again, thank you for, for this work because it's very necessary and I burned out on it. So, mm-hmm. so thank you. Mm-hmm. And thank you for, for, you know, agreeing to come on the podcast at all. I mean, this has been an excellent conversation. I don't get a lot of chances to geek out in these conversations because, you know, I don't talk about technology anymore. So, so thank you so much. I'm happy that you considered this a geek out conversation. We started talking about like agile methodologies and, you know, UML, object-oriented programming. UML, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Hex codes came up. (laughs) True? You said CSS. You even even said CSS. So, you know, there's a lot to it that uh, I'm easily geeked. Maybe that's what I should say. I'm very easily geeked. Oh, me too. Me too. (laughs) Me too. Yeah. There you go. All right. Thank you again, Lindsay. Thanks so much. So happy to be here.